Let's save a little time. So, uh, George, my, there we go. Okay, so I only have a few slides, but I got a lot of text, and, and some of what I want to mention to you has been alluded to, some of it is much more direct. Let me tell you my perspectives. First of all, I'm the university librarian, and uh, I'm responsible for and with the Stanford University Libraries team writ large as providers of information and services in support of research, teaching, and learning. Secondly, and this is something invisible to you all, I'm a member of the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, National Institutes of Health, Committee on the Responsible Conduct of Research, a committee that's been meeting for the last several years, and we're in the act now of drafting uh, a, uh, an updated version of the book that came out in 1992. I want to emphasize that I'm not speaking for that committee, nor am I quoting from anything that we're drafting right now, but I am uh, uh, presenting some ideas that uh, have come through that committee. And finally, I'm responsible um, as an archivist and a publisher. I'm responsible for the Stanford University Press. I th consider my organization to be um, more than just a service provider to this generation of Stanford uh, folks, but also for generations to come and generations not even at Stanford. So there's a cultural role here. We're custodians. And also, as the publisher of Stanford University Press, I'm really very much interested in the rights, responsibilities, and recognition of authors. We've heard a lot about data today. Let me just say that I think data is evidence, and data takes a lot of different forms, uh, and evidence is absolutely necessary for the advancement of knowledge. Uh, and data and evidence are particularly inherent to, to, uh, to science. Let's review a little bit of some of those formats. We have heard about numbers as data, uh, text, we should confront text as data. The work of Franco Moretti in the Lit Lab shows that uh, masses of text are absolutely data. The images of uh, manuscripts, cuneiform tablets, and so forth, that's data. The uh, photos in this Carlton Watkins exhibit from all over Northern California, that's another set of data, depending on who's looking at it and what, what's going on with it. The, Music that's recorded on the player piano rolls we just bought a little while back for folks in the music department, that's data, very interesting data. Uh, survey results uh, that you've shown, absolutely data. Uh, videos of behaviors, definitely data. Um, working models, physical models as well as virtual models, also data. Retrospectively converted observations of events. I'm thinking of the work by James Wiley at IBM and converting data from thousands of meteorological stations all over the US done in the 80s um, uh, from weather stations and weather reports, some done by hand. All that is data. And finally, maps and geo, geo information, all that is data. We have to recognize there are lots of different forms of data and Data is in the eye of the researcher and ultimately the consumer, too. We have to realize that observational data is unique primary evidence. It cannot be reproduced or derived. If it's not archived, it's gone. The water temperature of Monterey Bay, for instance, on April 13, 1915, cannot be measured again today. And public opinion from 1695 cannot be recorded, uh, it cannot be uh, resampled. Not that they were collecting public opinion in any, in any uh, formal way, but we can read about uh, attitudes, right? Uh, outside of research reproducibility, experimental and or computational data may also merit archiving when the cost of recreating it outweighs the cost of archiving it. Very important. A current researcher asked at Branner for someone who wanted a SESTA geolocated data set related to railroads that had been, been heard of. The, opinion was, the, uh, the question was referred to SESTA recently, where they found that the data set was assembled by a grad student who had left some little while ago, more than a year ago. No one knew where the data set was or if it still existed. Of course, it could be uh, re-derived, but it would be costly to do that. Let me see if I can get this thing to show up now. Can't. So here's the Office of Science, Technology, uh, 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 Science and Technology Policy in the White House. Uh, a brief on the right-hand side, you see the letter. Of course, you cannot read it, nor can I. 
But the, the summary is in those bulleted points right there. There is uh, an increasing number of, uh, of uh, there's an increasing emphasis on making data from federally funded um, um, research available for the purposes of re reproducing experiments, but also just for the ability of the public to know what's going on and ultimately perhaps for some mashup of this data with other data to create new knowledge. Increasing numbers of foundations are increasing on the, the, uh, the uh, same requirement. So we will eventually be in a complete, com I think, a completely open environment. Um, another thing we have to recognize is that our age, which may we, we may date from the, the availability of mosaic, uh, has meant new elements to what we do and how we do it particularly in human communication. So with the advent of that kind of communication, that digital communication that links us ever more closely across the world, lets us form up new collegial relationships and thus to work with new groups and to distribute our findings to those folks, we have new methods of research, new questions that can be posed, um, including intergenerational communication that would ultimately lead to a lot of new knowledge. We are in a different place than we were even 20 years ago. However, this digital age has meant new pressures on scientists and other scholars. The question of primacy of, of findings, um, intellectual property rights, um, information that's useful, uh, an opinion that's useful for appointments, promotion, and tenure, and the whole ma matter, uh, matter of grantsmanship. Who gets what money? Who's who is well regarded? What institution produces great researchers? What institutions are ignored? What institutions have infrastructures that permit the kinds of work that we're doing here and thus enhances the reputation of individual uh, uh, researchers when they go to foundations and agencies for money? There's more intense competition for students um, uh, and for public and professional recognition in this very, very highly communicative age. There's more need for money. We're seeing bigger and bigger projects, more interesting projects. Projects, there's a lot more technology involved. So the competition for funding, which is basically static or declining, uh, is higher uh, relatively and actually. Unfortunately, these pressures have led to a few, a very few scholars falsifying, fabricating, and or plagiarizing research results, among other detrimental practices. And I want you to Look up if you haven't, if you don't know about this case, but it's a case of a man named Anil Potti, P-O-T-T-I, a Duke University medical researcher who was falsifying and fabricating data on cancer and had proposed some cures or at least some therapies for cancer that were going to involve human subjects. There was a whistleblower in his lab who was routinely ignored by the Duke administration there were computational biostatisticians at the MD Anderson group who three times analyzed this man's results in his articles and three times blew the whistle. And it wasn't until he was about to have permission from the, I think it was the FDA, to allow some of his therapies to be tried on an experimental, experimental preclinical uh, trial basis that he was caught and stopped. And ultimately he lost his job at Duke Nobody died from his experimental approach. He is still practicing medicine, however, in North Carolina. There is there is plenty of information about this case, and there's a particularly good article by uh, Tina Gonzalez that I recommend to you about the need to test results, the reproducibility of results. Digital publication and digital analysis of research results has reinforced the need for transparency of reports of results, including key methodologies, agents, software, and data. We need to be able to re reproduce research, as many have said today. We need to demonstrate to our citizenry, the taxpayers, of the value and validity of the scholarly enterprise, in gross and in particular. Apparently I've got some more slides. This is the NSF position on data archiving issued before the OSDP. This is why it's important to Stanford that we have wonderfully supportive infrastructures to the research that's going on. We need to have a good reputation here, which we do. We need to be able to support data management plans, which we do 
with some exceptions. I'll come back to those exceptions of involving very large numbers of bits and bytes. We have to note well that the popular press, mostly news outlets, and particularly the politically inclined sort, and the likes of Retraction Watch signal the intensity of scrutiny on scholarship, particularly science and medicine, for failures, especially ones that produce buzz and thus income to these agencies from what we might call edutainment, those that exploit failure. Public outcry regarding such failures results in discounting the values, processes, and findings of scholarship and science with the possible result of diminished political and fiscal support for the enterprises of science and scholarship in general. Quoting from the 1992 publication of the National Academies of Sciences and Engineering and the Institute's, Institute of Medicine book I, I mentioned before, Responsible Science, Ensuring the Integrity of the Research Process, I, I want to read three paragraphs to you. They're important. The community of scientists is bound by a set of values, traditions, and standards that embody honesty, integrity, objectivity, and collegiality. These values are reflected in the particular principles and practices characteristic of specific scientific disciplines. The diversity, flexibility, and cre creativity of the research community, strengths that have been contributed to decades, that have contributed to decades of scientific achievement and progress in the United States, also derive from the decentralized character of the research enterprise. Second paragraph. For centuries, scientists have relied on each other on the self-correcting mechanisms intrinsic to the nature of science and on the traditions of their community to safeguard the integrity of the research process. This approach has been successful largely because of the widespread acknowledgement that science cannot work otherwise and also because high standards and reputation are important to scientists. Dishonest or untrustworthy individuals become known to their colleagues through various mechanisms, including word of mouth and the inability of other scientists to confirm their work, their work in question. Such irreproducible work is recognized and discredited through the processes of peer review and evaluation that are critical to making professional appointments, accepting work for publication, and awarding research support. Close quote. The integrity of research requires transparency of hypotheses, methods, agents, findings, interpretations, true authors, and evidence, data. In order to ensure the integrity of research and the communication of knowledge and the evidence supporting it to the next generations, preservation of the reports of science in all of its parts, including data, um, uh, must be allocated to trust, trusted non-conflicted third parties, librarians and archivists. It's essential. And not just the published reports are necessary. In addition, the code books often mentioned today and other specifications of the evidence, the data, must be archived as well. The software applications used for gathering and displaying the data, the data formats or encoding standards, the specifications of instruments used to gather the data, and the choice of data elements will help make the research reproducible and assist the scientific statisticians um, in, making, in evaluating the results without, uh, even without attempting to re reproduce the research. In addition, by making these elements, data, code books, data formats, software specifications uh, visible, the data can be reused and mashed up by other researchers, possibly leading to new research and new results. It is important to confront two issues of intellectual property. First is true authorship or inventorship, a made-up word, and embargoes. Reports of the results of research, including data, need to act to accurately and precisely cite those actually responsible for the research, the PI, and any postdocs, grad students, undergraduate students, and colleagues who contribute meaningfully to the research. Those who contribute methodologies that are not directly uh, um, involved or directly built by the PIs, et cetera, those who contribute uh, extra data, extra code, should be acknowledged as contributors, but they're not the same thing as authors. <clears throat> Interdisciplinary research and the varying standards and practices for identifying authors in the reports of research, such as honorary authors and mere contributors of previously written software or agents, have made unclear who is actually part of the teams. Uncollegial behaviors, intimidation even, have no place in research. There are occasionally good reasons for embargoes by 
for, of data by researchers. The conduct of long-term sociological research on which careers are built could be such a case. Embargoes, in my view, however, should be short-term so that the progress of research will fall, flow unimpeded. This matter deserves wider, broader, and open discussion among the interested parties so that the principles and limitations can be more generally understood, agreed, and made apparent. Now, regarding the multiple functions a true digital archive might provide, let me say the following. Trusted third parties involved in the savings of results in physical and now increasingly digital archives need to account for the broad range of specifications, requirements, and possible failures of systems and technology, technologies underlying their archives. <clears throat> the following considerations are observed in the Stanford Digital Repository. Now what follows is largely uh, uh, an ad for the Stanford Digital Repository. Uh, the first is that we need to account for the possibilities of human failure. The, the greatest uh, cause of failure in digital archives is human failure, not technology failures. Secondly, we need to have modular archives that allow successive firewalls more easy updating and replacement of parts of systems and adoption of newer and better methods. We need st to store various versions of results, including data and code books. We do not believe that it's useful to simply substitute a new version for an old version. We don't want to save everybody's version of all time, but we need to save versions. We need to employ air gaps and firewalls and other security measures to prevent unauthorized access or changes to the results, including data and code books. We do that. Multiple copies of reports and data, including code books, in multiple locations and on multiple storage media, preferably in multiple different archival systems and environments, is very important. And here we're invoking the lots of copies keep stuff safe and the avoidance of single points of failure principles, both of them. Creation and expansion of discovery functions through usable metadata for s data, software, and reports that are enhanced by including publications, annotations, and citations of use of the reports. Mark highlighted this in his pr presentation. I think that the articles and, uh, that make use of data are highly valuable uh, for um, as metadata and for use in inference engines. Mark has seen at least one that has, seems to work pretty well. Audits need to be conducted by independent agencies periodically of archival systems and holdings. Finally, encouragement by depositors and archival systems operators and owners for the use of reports, results, and data is quite important. So as you all deposit your data, we need to know, we would, we'd, be, we'd be happy to know that others are making use of your data so we can encourage the reuse of data, encourage the deposit and thus encourage the reuse. And as we find that mashups of data produce new uh, findings, we need to know about that and celebrate that. The Stanford Digital Repository is responsive to the principles of, for digital archives enunciated in the OSTP memo of 22 February 2013, which I just showed. Please note, that we in the Stanford University Libraries have been working on the SDR in one formulation or another since roughly 1997 and have had instantiations of its present form and operations since 2007, including the work of a faculty advisory board led by Russ Altman on principles of deposit and principle of, of access to that uh, repository. It's, uh, those principles remain constant and they're, they're generally access, uh, useful, I think, over centuries. The SDR is a service of, Stan of, S of the Stanford University Libraries. It's, focusing, it's focused on maintaining the authenticity, integrity, and reusability of data in a secure, sustainable, and trustworthy environment. Let's see if I can find another. Oh yeah, we use persistent uh, URLs. We distribute copies of all the holdings of the SDR on digital archival tape in six different locations, only two of them on this tectonic plate. And much of what we have is available in, um, on magnetic disk, although, of course, if the power goes out, we've got troubles. We are a campus organization with a mandate for maintaining intellectual assets and output of the university over generations for researchers for today and tomorrow. The SDR supports each of the following related but distinct considerations in managing, preserving, and providing access to deposits. The first is access control. Does the whole world get to see what you put in? or just Stanford, or just an individual? Who can see the data? We consider embargoes, and we provide a time-limited 
uh, uh, time-based access control based on the principles that Russ Altman and that faculty advisory board gave us. When can people see this stuff? We're quite concerned with licensing, thus my question about the Creative Commons license, which I think is licenses, which I think are quite useful. And we're very worried about attribution. Who should receive credit for the deposit when cited or reused? This is a question of discovery. The metadata from the PIs, I think, as Mark has very nicely uh, laid out, is, is essential. But the metadata of the, those who make use of the files is also interesting. And we are especially interested, as I've said, in the articles that arise from the research that is related to the file. We are experimenting with Mark and linked data. And we are working on inference engines, or at least an inference engine, that will make use of the full text and some of the other text in the metadata to provide hypotheses of relevance between ideas or among ideas. We are seeing lots of new interest uh, in the SDR uh, from researchers who are attracted by its multiple functions, not just of preserving and making accessible the data, but essentially of publishing the data for the long term. We use the persistent URLs. And this is a shot that shows you uh, the relatively quick uptake. We have, uh, we're showing about 250 um, data management plans that have been um, in implemented. And the number of uh, digital items in the repository uh, pursuant to the data management plan requirement running at about almost 1,200 after, let's see, since the winter of 2013, not even two years. We are watching the emerging federal agency data policies, and we think that we're pretty well positioned now to play a useful local role in the emerging landscape. The federal requirement for data management plans depends upon the operation of digital archives without failure. However, the requirement and its dependence on archives like the Stanford Digital Repository is not funded. Failure to implement data management plans will result in criticisms and perhaps downgrading of an institutional PI's ability to get federal grants and contracts. This is unsettled territory. Presently, SDR is running without specific funding from Stanford or elsewhere, although I can tell you that uh, we're, we're spending more than $3 million a year on the SDR and have been for some years. Um, as the SDR is capable of ingesting multiple terabyte files, but it is not capable now of ingesting petabyte scale files. This is a problem. If the U.S. government, excuse me, how will we solve it? Should SUL charge PIs? We don't want to. With files over a certain size, say 100 terabytes for SDR services, should the federal agencies be asked to provide that money either in the direct or indirect cost statements? It's a problem because we're at max for indirects, and we don't want to take money from the direct budgets either. There's a, there's a little bit of a dilemma there. If the U.S. government and the non-secret agencies establishes working digital archives, should Stanford PIs depend upon federally run digital archives? We intend to keep growing SDR's capacity and therefore its ability to support Stanford, Stanford's researchers in realizing our data management plans. By doing so, we, meaning Stanford University Libraries and the Stanford PIs, will also be providing Stanford, uh, Stanford scientists and scholars, excuse me, scientists and scholars elsewhere with valuable data for use in creating and revealing new knowledge. An ecosystem of digital archives is needed around the country and around the world for the goal of reproducing the results of scholarship and enhancing the creation of new knowledge. SUL and the SDR team are contributing to the evolution of that ecosystem, both by being a good model, one responsive to Stanford researchers, but also by creating open source applications that other institutions are employing. We're also a participant in something called the Digital Preservation Network, which is a um, attempt to have a federation of digital archives, an attempt that is uh, still in test and there's no guarantee that it will succeed. Our direction is clear and our intentions firm. The increase in the wherewithal, the funding to expand SDR's capacity is not clear. So some concerted effort by Stanford faculty, PIs, will be necessary to secure that funding. I want to thank all the speakers today, Chris Borgman, Brian Wandell, Steve Goodman, Ross Paldrack, Michael Rosenfeld, Audrey Ellerby, and Mark Musen for their presentations, their terrific colleagues. The SDR has been developed and is operated by a team led by Tom Kramer, Tony Navarrete, Hannah Frost, Lynn McRae, 
and Amy Hodge, among others. And I also think we all owe Amy Hodge and her team for organizing this day to day. day, to day. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, one and all. When is lunch being served? <laughs> Anyone? Um, I'd like to thank um, all of our speakers for coming today, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming as well. I think we've had some really good um, discussions going on. I want to be sure to thank the people who paid for this event, our sponsors, um, Stanford University Libraries, of course, uh, the Dean of Research's Office, the School of Engineering, and the Stanford Photonics Research Center, all of whom contributed funds for this event. And to everyone who's helped out, including Sarah Lafort from the Stanford Photonics Research Center, who's been out front all day, uh, Julie and Tony and Hannah and Hannah and variety of other people.